today's video is going to be a pretty short uh, run over just some set operations. Uh, in all reality, it probably could have been tacked on at the end of the last video. So we had our little axioms and we were able to start constructing new sets, things like the power set of a set, and we were able to take unions. Uh, however, one thing that wasn't mentioned, which is one of the basic operations of set, is that of intersection. Uh, but we're already able to do this uh, from the axiom schema of comprehension. So we can simply define the intersection of two sets, A and B. Uh, well, we know that uh, the axiom of comprehension says that given any set, we can form all the elements belonging to that set that obey some property. So we can simply define this to be uh, those elements which are contained in A such that and they obey a property, namely in this case the property is that they belong to B. And of course this definition is symmetric. Uh, you're welcome to check that if we had defined it in terms of those X and B which also belong to A, uh, this of course recovers our familiar intuitive definition of what intersection means. Now, we had also discussed that we can take the, the union of a single set, and it was in fact this that gave de rise to the definition of a union of two sets in general. Uh, so one may wonder, well, what about the intersection of a single set? Does this make sense? Well, in fact, it does, and we define the single intersection of S to be the set such that uh, an element is in the intersection of S if and only if X is in A and this time it's for all A belonging to S. Another thing that shows uh, the describes some of the symmetry between union and intersection is using this singular union uh, we can find that if we had two sets A and B by the axiom of pair, we create the set uh, which has them as a pair. And then taking the singular intersection actually recovers the definition of intersection we made above. Just one technical aside is that we do not define the intersection uh, of the empty set. We leave this thing undefined. The reason being, if we attempted to do this, uh, it would say that X is an element of the intersection of the empty set if and only if X is an element of A for all A, which is in the empty set. Now we have a problem because this actually is satisfied by every single possible X. Now, you may say, hey, whoa, wait a second, there isn't actually anything in the empty set. And that's the whole point. It, because there's no elements in the empty set to begin with, every element vacuously is contained in those sets which are elements of the empty set, because there are none. So therefore, this set, the intersection of the empty set, would have to be the set of all sets. And we've already seen that our axiom schema of comprehension rules this out from happening. So we definitely don't want to have our definition encompass the case of the empty set. Now, from this point, we can also define some of our other familiar set operations, uh, such as the complement, the relative complement of two sets. Uh, this, of course, we would define to be all those X in A using our axiom schema of comprehension. Uh, and this time, in contrast with the intersection property, we take the property that X does not belong to B. And this recovers our normal uh, definition of the relative complement of two sets. And now that we've defined uh, intersections, unions, and complements, we can also define the symmetric difference of two sets, being A minus B union, B minus A. So at this point, the, the first six axioms have really recovered a lot of the basic operations we can do in naive set theory. One thing that's still missing from our arsenal is the notion of Cartesian product of sets. That is, we define a set A cross B such that all of those elements of the set 
are ordered pairs uh, where A belongs to A and B belongs to B. So in order to make sense of this definition, we of course first need to define what we mean by ordered pairs. As a first attempt, we might try and just say that the ordered pair A and B uh, is just the set containing uh, two elements A and B. Uh, the problem is this doesn't really give us a well-defined order to these elements because as far as our axiom of extensionality tells us, this is equal to the set B equal to A, and in turn that this is equal to the ordered pair B equals A, and we don't want this to be the case. So that won't do. One thing we could try is defining this, the ordered pair AB to be the set which contains A and the set containing B. Now this makes a clear distinction. The one which is on the right is the one that belongs to a set inside of the larger set. And the one on the left is the one that the element that just belongs to the set itself. Now there technically isn't anything wrong with doing things this way, but the actual definition is slightly different and there's a, sort of a nice reason why that is the case. For our definition, we're going to define the uh, ordered pair A and B to be the set containing the set containing A and the set containing A and B. Now the slightly nicer thing that happens in this example is when we consider the ordered pair that has A in both slots, uh, this just becomes the set containing A, uh, the set containing the set containing A, and the set containing A and B, since B is equal to A, this just becomes a set containing just A, and so that is really just the set containing the set containing A. And Okay, maybe this is a matter of preference, but uh, the thing is, in this case, there's really just one, it's the same element in, in both pairs of the tuples, and so then in the set that defines the tuple, there's really just one element in it. Uh, compare this to the case where if we defined the ordered pair A and B uh, to be A and the set containing B, uh, in this case, if we took the tuple AA, then we would have A and the set containing A, which would still have two elements. So not a big deal, we could make the theory work anyways. Furthermore, the definition we've taken is going to allow us to generalize to n-tuples much easier. So given our definition, we can now define a triple of elements to be the tuple, which is first the tuple of A and B, and then C. And then we could even go on to define the uh, quadruple of elements, which would be first defined by the triple of elements, A, B, C, and then the uh, D at the end. Now you can imagine this goes on for entipoles, but the thing is we can't actually make this definition yet, because in order to do that, we really need to have a notion of natural numbers and induction, which we haven't created at this point in time. In fact, there's nothing in our theory so far to even suggest that infinite sets exist. So we'll need to do some more work to get there. For now though, we're pretty close to being able to define the Cartesian product of sets. The issue is, still facing us, we've defined what these ordered pairs are, but where do these ordered pairs live? Remember, our axiom scheme of comprehension basically tells us that sets have to look like x in a such that p of x. So what is the a that these pairs belong to? And the answer is the following. The Cartesian product of a and b is going to be defined to be the tuples, and you'll see why this makes sense in a moment, of the power set of the power set of a union b. So the axiom of pair and axiom of union allow us to create the union. The power set axiom allows us to create these power sets. Uh, and of course, this is going to be subject to the condition that uh, little a is in big A and little b is in big B. So why does this make sense? Well, our tuples 
A and B, these are sets which themselves contain sets containing elements from A and B. So in, in order to get these sets, notice that the set containing A and the set containing A and B, these both belong to the power set of A union B. And so in order to get sets that contain these sets, we then need to consider the set of all subsets of the power set of A union B, and that means taking the power set of the power set of A union B. And thus finally, we have the definition of Cartesian product. The other thing that our definition of tuples is going to allow us to do now is to explore the other major theme here, the, the other basic object in set theory, and that is the notion of functions. Before developing functions, though, we'll first have to talk about uh, the theory of relations, which we'll develop in the next video. Again, comments, questions, concerns, please leave them in the comment section below. And thanks for watching.